Okay, so continuing on, gustation, aka the sense of taste, just like olfaction is a fancy way of saying smell, gustation is a fancy way of saying taste. There we go. Let's see. Okay, so the bumps on your tongue. Most people would look at the bumps on your tongue and say, those are taste buds. They're actually not. They're papillae. The taste buds are actually microscopic structures on the sides of those bumps. We have four different types of papillae. Valate, folate, filiform, and fungiform. The valate are very easy to see. If you stick your tongue out across the back here, you've got these huge valate, <clears throat> excuse me, papilla. They are the largest, they're the least numerous. Usually we have between eight and 12, and they basically are kind of our landmark for the border between the front and the back of the tongue. The folate papillae, which are these right here, um, are distributed along the sides of the tongue where the folds are. Um, they actually are the ones that contain the most sensitive taste buds. So, you know, when you taste something and it doesn't taste right, we tend to want to scrape the sides of our tongue. That's actually the reason why. We have a lot of these when we're younger but the number actually decreases with age. That's one of the reasons why our taste changes as we age. You know, as, as a kid, you taste a pickle at the movie theater and you go, oh yeah, this is great. You give a baby a pickle and they kind of whoo, and that's probably why. They are located most mostly posteriorly. Um, now, the third type of um, papillae that we have is the filiform papillae. Filiform papillae are over here. Now, remember I told you about the taste bud being microscopic? So that's these little things right here. You can see them on all of these, okay? But look, there are none here, okay? The filiform papillae are the most numerous on the tongue surface, but they don't have any taste buds. They actually provide a rough surface for us to manipulate food. They're the ones that are kind of like the hooks that help us to get our food into a ball form when we're eating. Now the fungiform. Fungiform look like a mushroom. That's why they're called fungiform papillae. They're scattered irregularly over the entire top surface of your tongue. Now, again, the sensory structure is the taste bud. It is not the papillae. So taking a closer look, you can see the taste bud over here in these pictures. And taking this square right here and blowing it up, we're going to look a little bit closer. So you've got this kind of oval structure. Whoops, sorry. Nope, that wasn't it either. There we go. It's hard to see. You've got kind of this oval structure here um, embedded within the surface of the tongue. And we have about 10,000 um, 10, per tongue. Um, there are three cell types. Now remember what I said about kind of that same uh, group of cells. You've got, give me a second. You've got the supporting cells. The supporting cells again are non-sensory and if you look at this picture here, you'll see them in yellow. They're the ones that are kind of surrounding our gustatory cells. They're not really going to be um, sensory as much as the nanny to take care of um, the gustatory cells. Now we've got basal cells. The basal cells are these cells down here. You can see them, wow, I just completely covered that up, um, down here. 
Like the basal cells in our nose, these are the ones that will replace the actual gustatory or taste cells if there's damage. Everybody has done this. Hello, hot cocoa, and you burn your tongue. Or hello, hot coffee, and you burn your tongue. And for a few days, you feel like you can't taste anything. Well, that's because you've damaged these cells. So let's talk about the big kahuna the gustatory or taste cells. These are our sensory cells. There are about 50 taste buds, um, each with about a 10 day lifespan. Think about it for a second. We are very rough with our mouth. If you eat potato chips, if you eat popcorn, that's like putting sandpaper up against your tongue. So we do need kind of a high turnover there. They are continuously replaced. That's why if you burn your tongue with hot coffee, it's not like you never taste anything again. Because they're continually, continuously replaced, eventually they do get fixed or, well, replaced. If you take a closer look at a gustatory cell, they also have those hairs that are sticking out. Now, what's inside your mouth? saliva, right? So you've got saliva in your mouth and along these taste buds, you'll notice that there's kind of this indention. This is called a taste pore, okay? The taste pore is basically what allows the saliva with its dissolved chemicals that we call tastins, okay? to go in there and interact with these gustatory hairs so that we have that chemical response of, oh, I'm tasting something salty or, oh, I'm tasting something sweet. So the chemicals that cause the sense of taste are called tastins. They need to dissolve in saliva and enter those taste pores and that way, through various mechanisms, they can cause the taste cells to fire, to have an action potential, or if you want to say, to depolarize. They're actually going to send signal once they get this specific taste in bound to their membrane. Taste cells don't have like classic axons. You're not going to see something that looks like a weirdo palm tree with feet. Okay, you're going to see something that looks like this, which again does not look like a weirdo palm tree with feet. So that classic look isn't there. But what I do want you to notice is that there is a second neuron here. Mm -hmm. So in chapter 14, we discussed primary and secondary neurons. Primary neurons were the ones that the same cell that picked up the signal is the one that sent the signal. This is an example of secondary, where you have two cells in the pathway. You've got one cell that is picking up the signal, in this case, the taste in signal. And then just like with a regular neuron, it has synaptic vesicles that it releases chemicals to get to another cell to cause that cell to carry the signal. So you've got two cells in the pathway. The first cell picking up the signal that basically relays the message to the second cell that carries it the rest of the way. It does serve the same um, purpose as a synapse. It's where the um, neurotransmitters are released and that begins that chain reaction of sending the signal to the nervous system. We have five primary tastes that have been, I guess, elucidated. We've got salty, we've got sour, we've got sweet, we've got bitter, and if you watch Food Network, we have umame, because that's the way Food Network says it. So, salty. Salty is caused by metal ions. That's who our, well, I guess that's what our taste in is. Sodium channels will open. It causes depolarization. Remember, depolarization means that I'm going to get an action potential. My cell is going to fire. It's going to send signal to another location. 
As far as sensitivity and threshold, it's very low sensitivity, meaning it takes a lot of salt before we go, oh, that's salty. And it has a very high threshold. Remember what I said about pain. If something has a high threshold, what does it mean? It means that I can take a lot of it. This is why we can eat things like salty fries from McDonald's like nobody's business, or we can eat popcorn at the movie theater like nobody's business, or we can eat a whole bag of potato chips like nobody's business because we can stand salt. We can withstand that salty flavor for a long period of time. Now, sour. Sour is caused by acids. And in this case, um, in AP1, we talked about what the simplest acid on the planet was, and that was a hydrogen ion. Okay, so hydrogen ions in this case actually cause the depolarization. They are the ions that flood into the cell and change the charge that cause it to send signal. And it can work basically in three ways. Hydrogen can actually enter the cell. It can be the ion that causes the cell to change charge. Or it can actually act as a ligand. Remember, ligand is the key that fits into the lock. In some cases, that key locks the door or shuts the door, which is what you're seeing here, okay? When the hydrogen is there, it's shutting this door down. Or it can act as a key to cause the door to open, allowing things to move. Like in the third example with the orange channel here. So don't forget that we have things in our cells that can flow out that would cause a change in charge in that cell. So when we close doors, we're not allowing those things to move. That can also influence the charge inside the cell, which is what's happening with number two, okay? Number three over here is actually more along the lines of what we saw in chapter 12 when one of the cells fired. Um, sweet. Sweet tastants are, no surprise, sugars, okay? Tastants will bind to a GPCR. So here's GRU. Here are alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay, well, I should say gamma, beta, and alpha, I think. My eyes aren't that good. When it binds, it activates adenylate cyclase, which in turn makes cyclic A and P, which activates something called kinase, which causes... A phosphate to be added to this channel. When that happens, we get depolarization in the cell. So the tastants bind to a GPCR. It causes depolarization. Now, kind of like with salty, it's very low sensitivity and very high threshold. You can eat a bag of M&Ms, right? So the bag of M&Ms is sweet, but you can eat it and it's not like you have two M&Ms and go, Hugh. cookies, you can have cookies. It's the same thing. It takes a lot of sugar before we taste sweet and we've got a very high threshold. We can take sweet for a really long time. Now, bitter, number four. Bitter is usually activated by bases. Um, so taste and spine to a GPCR. Here's my base. It binds to a GPCR. We've got, um, alpha, gamma, and beta doing their thing, turning on phospholipase C, which takes PIP2 and turns it into IP3. Don't worry about knowing the specifics of that. I'm not, I'm not asking you for chemical structures or anything like that. But what that ultimately does is it causes the release of calcium, which in turn causes depolarization. So bitter, bitter is high sensitivity and very low threshold. It doesn't take much bitter for us to go, huh, 
And it also doesn't take much bitter for us to go, I can't take it anymore. Okay? Why? Evolutionary, uh, evolutionarily, a lot of poisons are actually very bitter. Um, when they talk about arsenic, they always describe it as bitter almond. So this is probably an evolutionary trait that we have basically preventing us from eating things that could be harmful to us. Okay, and finally we have umame, which is going to be caused by proteins or the building blocks of proteins, amino acids. The AA stands for amino acids. And this is an example with glutamate, which is an amino acid binding to its GPCR, causing a series of events with adenylate cyclase getting turned on, making cyclic AMP, and binding to this calcium channel, causing it to open, causing calcium to flood into my cell. So positives flood into the cell, you get a change in charge, your cell fires, okay? So ultimately, um, Yuma May is actually one of the newest flavors that we know of. Um, when I was in grad school, there was no Yuma May. So this is actually fairly new and it's protein or meat flavor. That's what Yuma May is. So we've got salty. We know what that is. We know what sour is. We know what sweet is. We know what bitter is. Well, Yuma May is just that other flavor of beef or chicken or fish, but that protein flavor. Things that influence taste. Temperature. Temperature can influence um, taste and it can actually change um, how something tastes. For example, if something is very, very hot, the taste buds don't pick it up. Instead, your pain receptors kick in because it, it burns and you pick up more on the fact that it burns than what it tastes like. Cold. If you have something that is cold and you take the time to warm it up in your mouth, you can actually enhance the flavor of what you're um, trying, to, trying, what you're tasting. People who do wine tastings will actually do this. They will allow the wine to sit on their tongue. They will swish it around in their mouth to warm it up. They do like a weird sucky breathy thing to bring air into it. But ultimately what they're trying to do by doing all of these weird things mm -hmm. is they're trying to enhance the flavor of the wine. They're trying to taste it better. Texture can also change taste perception. I'll be honest, if you give me mushrooms out of a can, I will not eat them. They are slimy and they're nasty. If they are fresh mushrooms that are chopped and cooked with, I will eat those till the cows come home. But for some reason, canned mushrooms have that slimy texture. I can't. And it isn't about the taste of the mushroom. It's about the texture. It's kind of like oysters. I can have um, fried oysters and I'm fine. I have no problem with that. But oysters on the half shell? No, no. Mm -mm. Taste is also a rapid adapter, meaning that that was what I was looking for earlier with the sense of smell. Taste is one of those things that once you've had something for a certain amount of time, a, a let's say you have potato chips, eventually you don't really taste it anymore. I think one of the reasons that pizza is such a, a I guess, good thing to have, it, people like it so much, is because there are definite tastes to the different parts of the pizza that give you kind of a little something different with every bite, especially depending on the toppings. There's also a very strong correlation with smell. So one of the biggest, I guess, red flags that you might have COVID is the fact that you can't smell and you can't taste. So everybody who's ever had a cold, you, <sighs> I can't taste anything, right? 
that's actually part of this. We know that this exists. We know that that's true. As far as threshold goes, and we kind of touched on this before, it varies with specific taste. We have very high threshold for sweet. We have very high threshold for salty. Bitter, not so much. We have three cranial nerves that carry the information from different regions of the tongue. You've kind of got the front of the tongue, the well, back of the tongue, and then the kind of front of the throat. Each one, um, each of these nerves actually all terminate in the same place, which is the taste area of the cortex. But the nerve.